Ship's Man radio show. And tonight my guest is, uh, I've said it wrong, she's going to tell me off, so I don't mind. Sinia Finnfer? I'll give it. So, uh, you know, as long as you say hi, Cynia, we're good. Well, that's okay, Cynia. Right, you, she, uh, Pio says the following. All right, global pandemic, civil unrest, fires, hurricanes. Would you like to talk about something else for a change? Of course we would. Why not look back to the similarities and difference of being a kid 50 years ago, where life was a mashup of old-fashioned fun to space-age possibilities of what today's kids are navigating? So she's Cynia... Sinia is going to tell me a little bit about herself before we go talking about a book. Now, tell me a little bit about you. Okay, well, I'm, I'm hailing from California right now, but I was born in New York City in 1960. I'm the second of four daughters, and um, my dad had a career in finance which had us bouncing through the greater Midwest. I went to uh, five different grade schools in four different states. We started out in New York, and we went to Detroit. Minneapolis, Cleveland, and Chicago, which was challenging as a little kid, but I think it also makes you resilient. Um, and also, I just think that, you know, looking back, gosh, that was 50 years ago, I was 10 in 1970, and I think 10, you're firmly a kid. You're in your full level of um, childhood. And I think it's worth looking back at what we got to do and what we didn't get to do. And the phrase, helmet-free childhood, is we didn't have helmets, we didn't have car seats, we didn't have the you know, uh, cushions and things. And um, not that I'm saying that's better or worse, but it certainly was different. And obviously um, you had a quite an unusually sort of childhood that inspired you to write your book, obviously. Now, what was the main inspiration behind it? Did you sort of wake up one day thinking, I remember this period. I wonder what if I can compare it to now in some sort of bizarre way? Well, I think what happened was, you know, I, I write for a living. I'm a marketing communications person, and this has always been sort of kicking around in my head. Every every family has those epic stories of, you know, when Uncle Dan did a par- barbecue or when Aunt Mary tried to give the cat a bath, you know, those epic stories. So I have mine. Um, but I also needed to figure out how to write a book because that's not usually the form that I do. So I had two, two inspirations. From um, a structure standpoint, there's a woman by the name of Jenny Nash who wrote a book called Altered States, and it was the run-up from the, the moment her uh, boyfriend became her fiancé to the moment she was behind, at the back of the church about to walk up the aisle. But what I liked about the book that it was done in essays rather than chapters, meaning each each essay was self-contained. And I looked at that and said, I could do that, and it moved along. Um, I really am not a novelist at heart. I didn't think I really had the chops to do that, and I wanted to have my first book be something that I felt I could I could navigate easily. The other one is the spirit of it. There's a wonderful guy in uh, America. Uh, his name's Charles Phoenix, and he does these hilarious slideshows about mid-century America and Americana, um, just the crazy architecture and the cars, and he does it in a format of... Um, slides. That he, they're not his slides. He basically has gone to estate sales and taken slides and talked about, you know, the, the Airstream uh, mobile homes and how we went to school, how we went to camp, what, what was our fun. And it's hilarious because it's like you're looking through somebody else's photo book. What I loved about that was the spirit of it. He has a, he, he la- we have a lot of laughs watching his shows, but it's not mean spirited. It's joyful and reverent of a time that we're not going get to get, get to go back to. And, um, now let's refer to the book now, where it's called Confessions of a Helmet-Free Childhood, Churish Tales of an Analog Upbringing. Now, if I look inside the book, because I can do that, obviously, because I'm on the Amazon, which gives me a little chance to look at the, the chapters. We'll go a little bit chapter by chapter, but only we we'll only give a little snippet of what people can expect, because we don't want to give away too much, because obviously... <laughs> If, is, that, is that okay? So we took took the first one. Took a face plant in the second grade war. Yes. Well, basically, the, my entire class decided to play boy versus girl war. And 
what I decided, I negotiated that I could be sort of a diplomat, in, but I was a horse, because that makes perfect sense in second grade, and I could go back and forth and forth and back. Well, one of the little boys didn't buy that I had this diplomatic immunity and gave him chase. I tripped out of vine and fell flat on my face. I mean, knocked myself out. And when I came to, I was bleeding, um, and a uh, mom who took care of the schoolyard was carrying me up to the school. And I became quite the celebrity <laughs> for that experience, which is so second grade. And I think um, that's a very universal thing, that these, these, these spontaneous games that children play during recess and um, the outcome. So that, that's sort of the spirit of that story. And the next one is gamed pin on the tail on the donkey. Yeah, well, this, there's certain games that don't exist anymore. I don't know if they play this in, in England, but pin the tail on the donkey is that you have a picture of a donkey without a tail, and all the children get a numbered tail. You get spun one way, spun another, and then you kind of hobble blindfolded, um, and whoever gets their tail closest to the donkey's bottom wins. And the funny part of it is watching people stay, kids stagger around like they're drunk because they've been so spun. Well, I was last in line. And what the thing is, is that by the way I played it, I, my hands hit the posters. And by knowing where the edge of the poster was, I knew where the, where the end of the donkey pretty much was. And I, I won the game. And I was happy to win the game at that party, but I just realized I don't know how to play this game now, even if I'm completely blindfolded. And so I had a fabulous season of playing pin the tail on the donkey, uh, but I've now come clean with that confession. <laughs> I gamed it. <laughs> Lied my way into pet ownership. Now, I think everybody has done this, if you have a pet in your life. Um, a farm near our parents' house in um, Michigan had a slew of kittens every um, year, and I fell madly in love with this one little kitten, and I knew at eight weeks they'd start sending them off to their home and so I told my I lied to my friend's mother that yes this cat I you know my mom and dad said I could have this cat and I'm bringing it home well halfway home I saw my mom in the driveway and realized well uh I don't really have permission and I put the kitten down and tried to explain to her that we really needed this cat um but I think the whole dynamics of it that you know that you're a little kid and you want something so badly that you're literally willing to look somebody straight in the eye and say this is how it is when it is not I think it's a very universal story. And fate illness to evade a maths test. Now, okay, raise your hand if you haven't. <laughs> I've done this. Um, I did not prepare for a math test in third grade. It was looking bad. And as the teacher was preparing, I came and told her um, that my cat had fleas, which was true. And because I had flea bites, I needed to go to the office. She thought it was hilarious, burst out laughing, the uncontrollable laughter, and then looked at me and said, please tell the class what you just told me. Well, as a third grader, I was horrified, and you can read the rest of the story to find out what happened there. Crashed my sister's bike? Okay. My sister, I, if children of the 70s will remember the twin Stingray bike, which had a uh, very long... Uh, handlebars, a, a banana seat, and a sissy bar. It was a beautiful, beautiful bike. And I used to have permission, I had to have permission to use that bike. And I decided, oh, I'll take it out for a quick spin and see how fast I can go down the hill without permission. And I hit a bit of sand at the bottom of the hill. And I did not fare well, and the bike did not fare well. So it's sort of that, again, what kids do, oh, this will be nothing. <laughs> and it goes seriously sideways. And I hope the next one, your friend's still talking to you, destroyed my friend's <laughs> Doll. Again, this is a just tribute to a very important toy in my childhood. There was a toy called the Chrissy doll. And rather than looking like a baby, it was more like a, a preteen. Not quite as, as mature as a Barbie, but like a, a girl going on to a dress-up party. And she had a top knot on her hair that if you pressed her tummy, you could pull the hair out of her hair. So you could have either shoulder-length hair or almost down to her toes. Um, and then there was a, a crank on her uh, back to roll it back into her hair. Head. And so I thought, gee, um, you know, let's play with this doll. And the, the hair got stuck. And after trying a couple of things, I said, well, let's just cut her hair. And my girlfriend said, well, I don't think so. I said, oh, no, well, she's a Chrissy doll. She has an endless supply of hair. Let's cut the hair. So we did. And guess what? We wanted to make the hair longer. That didn't work out so well. So I will say I sent that very friend a copy of this book with my deep condolences for her Chrissy doll, wherever it may be. But, um, again, 
classic kid thinking I know what, what I'm doing and I have no idea what I'm doing. Challenged a bus route bully. Well, we've all had that, haven't we? I don't know what the situation is in England on buses, but we have dedicated school buses and, and it's a landscape into its own. You've got you've got some toughs, you've got that little crush of girls that make your life a misery and well, when my sister was bringing up a, a lovely friend home, it was very quiet and low key and the, the uh, school uh, bus route bully, Herbie, decided to just start teasing her indiscriminately about things, her hair, her face, her skin tone, everything. And I was sitting right behind them, and I just kind of was quiet and watched it. But he t teased her to the point that I saw a tear roll down her blushed cheek, and I got into it with him. And we didn't have a fight on the uh, bus, but once we got off the bus, we decided we were going to square off at his house. So... Uh, tune in for further details, but I, it was one of those situations I just couldn't bear to have go down. And trespassed into a museum exhibit. This will live in my heart forever. When I was in sixth grade, I had a boyfriend, if you can call it that, and um, his mom dropped us off at a museum. You know, think of like a natural history museum with all kinds of different things. And, you know, it was like 3.30 on a Tuesday, and we just trotted around, um, and we came upon this beautiful vignette. I think it was an English formal dining room. And not only was it beautiful, you know, with the furnishings, but the window was had, had been painted on what the view would, might, might look like. And my boyfriend kind of gave me a sideways glance that lifted up the cord, and I'm like, are you kidding me? And we can't do it. So we crawled under the velvet cord and slipped into the chairs of the dining room. We, we didn't mess about. We, you know, just played Lord and Lady for a good three minutes and then left. Well, you couldn't possibly do that now with motion detectors and so many guards all over the place. Um, but that's something that I'm really glad I got, got to do. Stole fireworks. Oh yeah, this is a big one. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm one of four girls. We had four boys living next door to us. Three of them in high school. They were like the, all, the, the three older brothers were all stars on our football team and their younger brother um, was our go-to playmate. And um, the third brother, who was in 10th grade when I was in 6th grade, bragged and showed me his firework collection, which he had saved up. And it was pretty impressive. It had like M80s and Roman candles, and you know, it wasn't just uh, little fireworks. And I thought it would be hilarious if I hit it all. You know, just And I, I had every intention of sending it back. But you can imagine the reaction of a 10th grader opening up his bedroom closet and, oh, easily $150 worth of um, fireworks are gone. So we had, we had a conversation about how that was going to be resolved. <laughs> Weaponized water balloons. Okay. Uh, we were very stay-at-home for Christmas family, but one time my dad had to us to a trip down to um, Florida. We were staying in this very tall hotel, and although we loved the beach and stuff, my sisters and I were really bored. And so we saw all these balloons being set up for New Year's. So we took fistfuls of balloons and went upstairs. And first we were just having a water balloon fight on the balcony with, among the three of us. We were having a great time. And then one went sailing down. And we thought, oh, that's fun. So we started throwing them down. Well, unfortunately, there were hotel um, staff members who were, were not so amused with our bombardment. Recycled a school project. Now, this was the, the plus side of uh, having been to so many different schools. Um, I, you are probably familiar with the name of Thomas Alva Edison, uh, the American who's credited with coming up with a light bulb, but I think Tesla would have a few things to say about that claim. Um, at any rate, uh, I had to do a paper at one school about you know, a great American, so I did that. And then I moved to Ohio, and we had to do a biography on an American scientist. I'm like, hey, I already have a paper. So, of course, I had to up my game a little bit, you know, for, for a sixth grade paper. And then in eighth grade, they had, I forget what the, the theme was, but again, Thomas Alva Edison fit. And so a paper that should have only been turned in once was turned in three times. Set the fondue kit on fire. Now, this is my epic story in my family. Um, there is a solvent. I think it's either uh, lacquer thinner or shellac thinner, I forget to this day, and that's the problem, um, that burns just like sterno. And we used to, you know, in the 70s, um, fondue was a really great trick. So my mom had us all set up the table, and she said, go get the fondue fuel. And I just opened up the closet and grabbed the first thing that I saw, because I recognized the label. But I did not read the label, filled the sterno um, container with said solvent, set it on fire, and, well, it didn't go well. 
And the next bit is Took the fifth in a food fight. Now, again, I don't know how this went down in, in England, but they, 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 put, they put the kibosh on this, but there used to be food fights. And the way this started, I was sitting with some girls and a, a french fry went sailing over from behind me, but a whole trail of um, fr uh, ketchup landed on it. We knew this was the shot across the bow. It was going to get bad. This was responded to with, like, some ice cream cups and some Fritos. And in short order, it was crazy. Like, it looked like a prison uh, food fight. Anyhow, there was a large, large, tall guy in my class who was across the room, and he had an apple that he wound up like a pitcher to throw. And to this day, I will tell you, he was not aiming for me, but I was sitting in the wrong seat, and it literally knocked me from my chair to the floor and gave me uh, an impressive shiner. I like the way you set out the book of the prologue. If, if, if I have your permission, can I just read the prologue bit of your book? Childhood is not a tidy process. A bundle of impulses and appetites. Most of us didn't know why we did things. We just did them. With mixed results, bouncing through life as best as we could. Being a kid could be humiliating one day, exhilarating another with a whole lot of ordinary days thrown in between. Confessions of Helmet-Free Childhood is a reflection of my messy ascension to adulthood as well as testament to experiences I had as a result. Being a kid in the 60s and 70s, I got to do certain things that did not exist for my parents and no longer exist for my kids. Lucky me. Baseball pitcher, whatever that is, Vernon Law saw, once said, Experience is a tough teacher. You get the f test first and lesson later. For me, this was standard operating procedure. Because by getting it wrong, we find a way to do the right. And as you've said before, um, Sine, I'm going to say, keep saying it wrong. Um, we we're going to have a discussion, compare childhoods between Britain 70s and America 70s. Now, my 70s, I grew up in a place called Essex, uh, uh, West Cliff on Sea. And one of my first recollections at school, I was asked to play the part of Mark Anthony, because my second name is Anthony. And I had to kiss a girl. And I was no way was going to kiss this girl. So I ran out of school, class, I ran out of school, and I was not going to go home. That's one recollection. And then one, the other recollection, we used we, we had a thing called Glam Rock over here. I don't know if you had it over in America. Anyway, um, we had a, there was a group called Mark Boland, the T-Rex. And all the girls used to have white pla pla plimsolls on, pure white plimsolls. And on them, they would always have Mark Boland on or T-Rex on them. Uh, and the other thing I remember from school is we had little quarts of milk, tiny little quarts of milk, because my granddad was in the um, the caretaker of my school before we left I let it where I was, and I used to get the extra little bit of quarts of milk now and again. We in this covert year now the child the children of today because they haven't experienced some of the harder times there may be debate about that they may debate what that as such but if we can look back in history and we can say we went over england we went through the bread strike we went through the three-day week um uh and all sorts of things in the 70s which were, you know, the petrol wars, you know, when the, pe the petrol was very dear and it was very hard to get stuff and drive cars and all that. And I think we experienced some of the hardships, so we, we had to be a bit tougher. 
And also, we didn't have a thing called the internet then. And I, I know it may shock children who are listening to this show, thinking, you didn't have internet? How did you cope? Well, well, not only that, but television wasn't 24 hours. The TV show, I, don't, I can speak in, in, in America, but television was not 24 hours. Star-Spangled Banner and a sign of the flag, and then it went to a test pattern. And cartoons were only on Saturday. When Cartoon Network came out, I was like, are you kidding me? 24 hours a day? Cartoons? Oh my gosh. Um, and I think the other thing is that uh, you, when, when school was over, you walked home by yourself. And now, I mean, uh, my kids live fairly close to the great school that my kids live went to was two blocks away. They couldn't do that as really little kids. But once they hit like third or fourth grade, I let them do it. But even so, it made me nervous because our neighborhood was something that a, a lot of people could cut through to get from one part of town to another. But um, I can remember just hanging out at the playground for a while and talking to friends and then walking um, to school, walking home. And one of my friend's older brothers was working on a car and I'd ask him about what he was doing. And then I'd see somebody's mom and she'd say, oh, I've got some new cookies. Come on out. We sat on the stoop and ate some cookies. And as long as I was home before dark, my mom did not worry at all. If my kids weren't home in 20 minutes, I was ready to send a search party out. Well, we used to play football on a little green down where I was. It was just a little bit of green. It wasn't like a proper green. It's just a little bit of large grass with houses surrounding it. Right. And you had to be very careful when you played football because if you kicked it too hard, it might go in someone's window. So we yeah. <laughs> had to be very, very careful. But we were, we used to spend hours going from to and fro to people's houses because everybody knew everybody. Even if you only knew them by sight, we'd go, all right, Steve, yeah, how's it going, mate? Yeah, all right. I think we're losing that now. Well, I was into football, or what you call over there, soccer, uh, and uh, and that's when back in the seventies, it's when I got first into wrestling. It, it used to be on World of Sport, which is an old ITV uh, independent channel that we got over here. It used to be on a late afternoon, and we used to work, watch the likes of Big Daddy and uh, Giant Haystacks, and we even had Brett the Hitman Hart came over to wrestle over this country <laughs> i do remember him it was he was quite young back then but he did come over right. and wrestle over here because i don't think he was as well known back then in the 70s as what well. he became famous for later in the 80s yeah well we had sergeant slaughter and a few other people in the world wrestling federation and there were hot, there was hot debate on the at the bus stop on how fake it was or how real it was. So I remember that. Some of the favorite uh, toys we had, I mean, of course, everybody had a Frisbee, everybody had a hula hoop, everybody had a pogo stick. Um, but as far as girl toys, we're going to put it in quote, one of my favorites was the Easy Bake Oven, which basically was this little construct of plastic with a little window so you could watch what you were baking. And you put a little cake mix, a little cake pit tin, you put it in, and basically with the heat of a light bulb, you bake this little cake. And we thought that was fantastic. But there were so many there were so many things that had heating elements in them that you, you naturally burned your fingers. And I think there's, I wouldn't say dumbing down toys, but there's some very sophisticated toys. But we sort of bubble wrapped and helmeted um, our kids' experiences that you, you don't learn how not to put your finger on the stove until you burn your finger on the stove. 
Do you think we took we? I know there's a lot of criticism of the '70s shows. I mean, we got a lot of criticism for some of them because they're considered racist or terms are used that are not appropriate in this day and age. But I, I think when you look back at it, I think somebody thirty years from now will go, "God, how did they get away with that back in 2020?" Oh, no, I, I, We had a show over here that we I used to watch regularly called Jack and Nori, where somebody would come on and they'd read like a story, like a famous story. And that's what got me into books. And I remember the first book I read at school, which I got into, I can't remember if it's the 70s or not, it could have been, was Day of the Triffids. That really engrossed me so much that got me into science fiction. I can remember that book clearly as if I read it yesterday but other books i'll be going mm, i've read it i think i've read it <laughs> well no but i mean similarly i think books like that science fiction books that really captured american children was uh a wrinkle in time and the phantom toll booth and i mean i love charlie and the chocolate factory and i mean when you learn the, the background of raul Dahl, and then, then he sat down i think he had the clarity to really call out the brats of our age I mean, we've all dealt with a baruch assault all dealt with a Mike TV. And Mike TV was basically the internet kid of our generation. This is a kid who just like has the TV on all the time and is kind of disconnected. And I think, again, I think the internet is a fabulous, fabulous tool. But just like anything, you know, you, you have to strike balance. Do you think the Wild West element of TV has gone and the YouTube and the streaming stations have taken it over a little bit? Because... Oh, you, Trouble is the youth. Well, I call it youth. Of, I think we learn to do research. We we we've learned by accidental knowledge. Now you may hear one thing. Say we heard like two nurses got ill over here because of the COVID injection. But it turned out that they both were allergic to the certain ingredients anyway. So therefore, they shouldn't have really taken it. So, but that two nurses were taken completely out of context. Out of the other well, people, they're perfectly okay. Sure. You, you no, hit the nail on the head. It's context. There's yeah. content and there's context. You can hear information, but then you need something to give you perspective. And so, I think the thing that's been interesting to 
watch my kids watch this election cycle is that they've had to see a lot of crazy stuff go out there and you have to sort of navigate through that. Um, I think with, um, you know, our childhood, when, when I was little, we had three network news and there was a guy in a tie in the, in the evening telling you what happened and they rolled a few little pieces of news. You know, now you sit down uh, to watch it, well, watch news. I can sit down right now and pull up my phone and see what's going on and then you can have alerts. I mean, you can make yourself crazy with new information all the time. I think the thing that is a challenge for our kids is to be discriminating and saying, just because I read it here doesn't mean it's true. What are the other channels saying? What are the sources that I consider valid? What's their take on it? And maybe even entertain that crazy uh, channel that you don't usually listen to just to get contact. Now, I've got a theory. I don't know if you believe me or not. I think that kids are getting too desensitized to death. Now, this is my reason. Because of games, they see a game, they kill someone, they come alive again. So just, they don't perceive it as normal. When they hear about death, they just think, oh, yeah. You know, they don't perceive it as well as we do. I suppose as you get older, because you're near the mentality... <laughs> Your mentality. No, I, I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I have a son who's 23 and he grew up on video games. And I remember he wanted um, Call of Duty. And I said, before you play Call of Duty, I want you to watch something. And we watched the opening sequence of Saving Private Ryan, which is, you know, landing on Omaha Hall Beach. And guess what? The bullets go in both directions. And, you know, that's, that's a really gnarly sequence. And he was pretty quiet about it. I said, I just want you to understand that what you see, you know, the screen goes black when you get hit and then you get to play again. No, the screen goes black and it's done. And I agree to you, I think I'm a little revolted by what is the standard fare for most video games. There's a, there's a, I think it's Red Dawn Redemption, I really like, which is like a cowboy, a Wild West thing, and yes, there's violence, because why else would anyone play? But it's done in the narrative of, you know, the settling of the Wild West. I think that's a, a little more uh, intriguing. But I think that you have to balance that. I, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a horror fan. I have friends who love horror movies, and that's never been my thing. But one of my girlfriends explained to me that watching a horror movie is like being on a, um, a roller coaster, that you're being tossed around, but you're confident that you won't get hurt. And the same thing, you watch horror movies because, you know, these ghastly things happen, but, you know, you're fine. I'm the kind of person... I can't unsee things. I mean, there are Twilight Zone episodes that I saw as a kid that haunt me to this day. I just, it's not my thing. Um, I'm not here to squash all uh, horror movies. I just think you have to uh, present it, yeah, you know, a, a, as a product and not uh, something. Yeah, I think you got, I, I mean, we all know when we watch a film or TV series, we suspend our belief just for that time because we know when you watch a soap you think yeah oh, come on that was his brother 16 times a move or oh well, is that really his sister oh no it's his mother you know that kind of thing you know it's all to one extent I think the not... thing is that it keeps escalating yeah you know the violence escalates the language de-escalates <laughs> and and i mean i i'm not an easily offended person but i think there's a uh, art to say something very scathing with elegant language. I think there's an art to a psychological thriller that's so much more interesting than blowing up a building and, you know, running away from a big cloud. Now, I think most 12, 12s nowadays will be 18 in back in the 70s. Right. But, I mean, no, people no, don't... No. I, I remember seeing Jaws before it got the 14 certificate. Okay. Because it was a PG, I think, over here. I'm pretty sure it was. But because of the one scene where the jo the shark eats the Robert Shaw character, I'm not giving anything away. It's well known. Yeah, no, we all know. We know how that works. <laughs> yeah, but um, that one scene, that's why it became a 14 and over. But nowadays, you watch a 12 film, you'll be going, how did they allow that? That, that couldn't. That, that's not a 12, is it? You're thinking you look at the, watching like an 18 movie back in the 70s. Well, I, I remember that Jaws changed the way I swam. I was always an enthusiastic swimmer in lakes and the ocean, and I rethought ever swimming at night again. I mean, I did, it changed the way I swam. Um, and that's, that's fine movie making. 
Um, but I think the thing that um, your desensitization to the thing that, that I find disturbing for American, uh, an entire generation of American boys growing up on video games who've never seen any active duty, I think that's very problematic. And I think that part of the thing that's torn us apart as a country in America is that we don't have this unified big thing. If everybody had to serve, like in Israel, everybody goes two years, I think that that would pull people together. My dad is like 87 years old, and he'll still talk about people he met while he was in the Army. And they were people that he would have never known had he not served. Um, and I think that's important. I have a friend whose son is 16 in Israel, and I was asking, well, do you have any ideas of where you want to go to college? And just doing, I said, a very unfair question for a 16-year-old, but just interested in how you're thinking. And he said, oh, well, first I have to do my army service. And I said, right, of course, I didn't think about that. I said, how do you feel about that? He goes, oh, I'm looking forward to it because all of my friends, older brothers and sisters say, you meet your very dearest friends during your army service. And I don't want to glorify military service, but by the same token, I think there's something to be said. When you take the children of the country and put them all together and they have to work together as a unit. And do you think how much politics has changed since the 70s to now? I mean, someone like controversial figure like, well, the un, the not the pr- a president that's now not the president, but he believes he's right. the president. Right. He goes big DT, we won't go too far, but we all know who he is. <laughs> now, I, I, I can understand his rhetoric in some way, how it worked the first time, because people wanted right. to hear it. It's people. It, it's a bit like I know he's not like Hitler. I'm not going to say Hitler, but the way the way he said things, the way he, people brought into it, they wanted to know it. They wanted to be, They wanted to see how he cope. But now he's sort of like looking a bit of an idiot because he's not taking the loss very well. I mean, we all know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Biden's come across as quite well how he's handled it. I don't, I don't know nothing about him. I, I admit. I mean, over here we don't. I mean, uh, we don't know nothing about him. All we know is his name. He's got a son, and that's about it. Right. Well, but, I, I think the thing that I would say, drawing it back to the seventies, I remember when uh, Richard Nixon uh, resigned. And okay, this puts it in total kid perspective. I was supposed to go with my girlfriend and. Her family, they were going to go to this little island off of Cleveland, Ohio, called uh, Fort Putin Bay. And it was like a fun, little inexpensive place to have a summer holiday. Well, Nixon was, his resignation was being broadcast on national television. And, you know, we're two eighth grade girls going like, who cares? Let's go. You know, what's, what's this all about? Another story that I'll remember is when the Kent State shootouts happened, I was 10. And my parents were always avid newspaper readers, and there was a copy. We lived in Minnesota at the time, but there was a copy of the New York Times on the counter. And there's this famous picture of this girl with a white protest kerchief around her neck with her arms out because her friend is face down in the pool of their own blood. And I, I, I said to my dad, what, what happened here? What happened here? And my mom said, well, um, there was a protest, and the soldiers came, and they shot one of the students. And my response was, but I'm a student. Like, you know, as a little kid, you know, okay, there are soldiers, there are policemen, there are firemen, there are, you know, there's the mayor of the town. But that was so upsetting to me that that's a thing, that a student could be shot by a soldier in the same country. I mean, one thing, it was like we were being invaded and soldiers from another country. But that really blew my 10-year-old mind. And I think the thing, when I listen to some friends who get so titched out, oh, we're kids with COVID, they're going to be all freaked out. And I said, one, it hasn't even been a year. And think about what your parents or grandparents went through during World War II. And does, it's pale to comparison. You know, I'm sorry, you have to watch the same show on Netflix for three weeks. <laughs> you know, boo-hoo. Um, but I think the thing is that, that, that it does pull people together. And I, I've, I've seen some of the coverage with the uh, vaccine going on in England and that it's giving people a sense of unity. And it's certainly giving us a sense of unity here and a sense of relief that, like, a, 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 you know, we still have a long way to go. But we have a light at the end of the tunnel. It's been fascinating to watch my friends and uh, younger relatives who have younger kids, how they navigate this. This is very hard for five-year-olds to deal with because the kindergarten is when you start socializing and you're in a bigger group and you learn to wait in line and you learn to take your turn with the scissors and you learn about colors and what have you. And it just doesn't lend itself really to 
uh, Zoom. I have friends who have two high school boys, both of them six feet, furious that they're home with mom and dad all day and then can't leave and go see their friends. And again, some Mandarin Chinese you can learn over video. Um, if you're trying to take industrial arts, that's a little trickier. So I think they'll all get through it. Um, but I think the other thing is, if, even though it's a bad time, you'll remember good things about it. Well, I find it uh, uh, strange that we that that when I was talking to someone the other day, I didn't know the significance of the Union flag to coloured people. I honestly didn't know because someone he he related it to some coloured people is considered as bad as a swastika because of the representation it means. Oh, I didn't. Flag. Yeah, I didn't know that. I, I genuinely didn't know that because I'm over here. Yeah. I'm not saying we've never had racial tensions. We've had a lot of it over the football. It was quite bad. It was it was disgusting. We that at one time the uni the uh, Saint George flag was considered a racist flag because the National Front claimed it were very anti-black, anti-Jew, anti everything. But when the football came along, and it the England were doing well in the football, the, the football fans gradually took it back so it no longer represents that anymore right. and I don't know I, I mean I'm not saying that the American people could take the flag back I'm not saying that but I think sometimes symbols are only symbols because we let them be because it, cause, well, yeah, I, think, I, I think you assign a value to something but, and I think the tricky part here is acknowledging the mistakes of the past without erasing them I mean I understand people wanting to pull down certain statues, but I think there's also something to be said for leaving a couple up, saying like, "Well, there was a time when we thought this was a good idea." Just like I don't, I want Dachau no. to always exist. It was a horrible, horrible thing, but I think people have to bear witness to that that place. So striking a balance between that. It's the same with books. I mean, there's certain I read certain books and I, I've had read it, and if it carries on with certain words, I'll keep it into a certain extent, and I'll I'll, I'll wash over it because it's gone too far. And yeah, you know, even in my opinion, it's going too far. But I would say, look, this book will contain language that may not be considered appropriate for this time and age. But then, like we said earlier, you'd probably be a book somewhere now on the shelves. There's somebody's going to read 20 years from now going, how offensive, how could they say such words? Right. But I think you need to see it again. That comes up to that word contact. You have to understand. I mean, I think of some of the jokes that were told to me in middle school or whatever, horrifying jokes. But, you know, that was, un that was taken. I mean, I'm uh, Irish, English, and German, and my dad told us a bunch of horrible Irish jokes and he said, look, you're going to be in a situation where people tell jokes and if you're going to tell jokes, you've got to tell some on your own. <laughs> that was his idea of equality. But, um, you know, I, I think the thing is, yeah, I think we all have to just take a breath and, and, and at least hear somebody out. If you don't even hear them out, and then yeah, I think the challenge is, is to find your own words to politely um, express why you're not okay with something. And that way you can get somewhere. If it just becomes a screaming match, um, nobody's listening anyhow. What would your advice be to um, the kids of today? Now, who obviously we, they, they're inundated with, as we said before, too much easy access to internet. And they they don't seem to go out. But I think the possibility, the trouble is, I think they don't want to go out. I think the... Well, I
hold all of this and then turn somebody out and go, okay, be an adult, and they've had no practical experience of, uh, of, of learning how to be an adult, well, you've got to mess up your head. Now, this time um, of the interview, please mention where people can find your book or any websites you wish to mention or anything else you wish to mention. Well, what I would say is um, if you want to get a taste of the book, my, uh, just Google, it's easier to Google, Confessions of a Helmet-Free Childhood. I have a website that has um, reviews, the first chapter, some photos, and also hot links both to Amazon and uh, Barnes & Noble. I know that because I did the hardbound, that I have international distribution. So I think Amazon UK has it. That, that would be my check point because they're everywhere. Um, but again, if you if you Google the title, you should be able to uh, come up with uh, local distribution. But again, I would say it's a fun read. Um, it's only like 60 pages. If you sat down and said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna go from start to finish," you probably you probably eat it in, a, in an hour. But um, I think it's more fun to take it as mor morsels. And again, I think. My main goal is that it helps you remember your childhood and gets you starting uh, talking about your epic story. Well, like we've done today, like we've had a good. Yes. Yeah, I think I think it's good to 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 um, talk about things like that. And also, um, have you any other books in the pipeline? Well, I you know you don't want to tell too much. Um, I've got a story from that time that I'm working on that has has to do with a sailing contest with three girls, one, myself being one of them, and it was a very unlikely win. Uh, it, uh, the working title is Libby T because that was the name of the sailing series, but I'm not much of a sailor, I'll tell you that straight off, and it was a very unlikely victory, but I think it also is very evocative of the times of, you know, Helen Reddy and I am woman, you know, we're all feeling very strong, and we had a very dreadful skipper, and in spite of him, we won the series. Obviously, you get some time off now and again, like everybody else does. What are you doing during your time off? Besides working, obviously. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I have the great fortune of, I live in the Coachella Valley, land of the big music festival, um, but we sort of have, revert, you know, summertime is hard for us because it can get up to like 115, 118 degrees regularly. Um, so now, this is like uh, my summertime. It's 70 degrees today, so I do a lot of bike riding and uh, swimming. Um, I like to horseback ride, um, I'm an avid reader, I love films, um, and I'm a big historic architecture uh, fan, so there's always something to, to check out. It's just hard, COVID has closed a lot of things right now, so it's more about um, getting things done around the house and exercising and getting out of the house <laughs> for a good three hours every day, so I don't mind it when the sun goes down at five, but um, you know, I, I, I'm very fortunate this time of year, having grown in the upper Midwest, I knew that I was in the house from sunset on and being in a place where the climate is nicer uh, during the winter time is, is really quite a luxury. Now if someone come along and said to you we'd like to make a TV series of your book because it's, it's more likely than films nowadays because it tends to be the done thing now doesn't it? Would you mind if they sort of did it but they took certain things out because obviously some things work for television and some things don't I think so as well. Now, this is the bit where I always ask the guests the following question: okay. What cine? I'm going to say I keep saying it wrong. I'm sure I am. That's all right. Um, what is your unique sign-off? My my unique what? Sign-off. My my unique sign-off. Yes. Uh, fly fly low and avoid the radar. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. And mine to you, cine, is the following: Well. I'd like to hear some confessions of a helmet-free childhood, truish tales of an analog upbringing, but I can't watch it, so I have to go and read it on Amazon, which is quite an unusual thing to do. So you can go and listen to stories about the 70s, 
How untrue. That didn't exist, did it? It must be a long time ago. It's not that long a time. It's only 40 years. What's that to some of us I know older years? But the youngsters, it feels like they were dinosaurs. But we tell them, no, that's not true. We're not quite that old. And good night. <laughs>